Uh, it's great to see all your smiling faces today. Uh, it is a little cold, so that's why I'm smiling. Um, loving this rainy weather, aren't you? Yeah? 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 Come on! Snow! A Basin's gonna stay open till July 4th. How crazy is that? That's so cool. Um, but it is Celebration Sunday, and these are the time, this is a, a time that we've set aside to celebrate what God's been doing, what He's been working uh, in our body, and uh, it's just great to share these things. So let me run through a couple of them. Um, so first one would be uh, Frenzy, which is setting up to do a missions outreach again to Fort Morgan, and it looks to be that this is going to be the largest setup uh, and largest group uh, participating as of yet. So it is a growing ministry, and as such an amen. Um, God is clearly working in the lives of the students, and they are excited to reflect him in their up-and-coming trip to Fort Morgan. Uh, also with Romans 10, there, were, there are many reports that uh, God, God's call is being heard and how uh, people are, have chosen uh, to be Jesus' hands and feet for future missions. Uh, children's ministry, uh, there are sign-ups back there. VBS is coming up. We're so excited to be uh, a sanctuary for families and for kids that uh, they can come and safely learn about Jesus and open up and... Uh, just receive his love from all the volunteers and from the lessons and everything that is shared there. Uh, Tuesday, corporate prayer time, uh, has been asking God to reveal his way, change his heart, change hearts that need to be changing, and prepare us for God's direction. Uh, God's direction is for our body of believers. God's presence and momentum is growing. We praise God that he has provided a way for us to bring earth as it is in heaven. As a foundational place of ministry at grace new wine which is god's move and new wineskins which are the flexible hearts to holy spirit's direction we uh, if you see it and you feel it around you praise his holy name adult ministries is exciting that uh, uh, willing hearts have stepped forward uh, to present new t- teachings here coming in the future and uh more people in grace are sensing and reporting God's presence and will uh, will in their lives and desire to submit to him with changed hearts. A number of members have reported God-breathed opportunities to share their faith and the gospel message of the cross while undergoing their, their own medical procedures and struggles. Praise God that he brings all things to good. The teaching team uh, wants to give a praise to God uh, for the the group that gives the Sunday morning messages uh, is excited about what God has revealed and is to reveal. They're blessed by the way God has led us through a Roman ser- uh, series and then the Sermon on the Mount and then coming parables of Jesus. God loves this church and he's calling us to be closer with him. He's asking us to forsake our previous ways and relating him uh, that we are uh, relating to him that are not fruitful. fruitful. And step more completely into his love and call in our lives. Grace's Grocery, what a blessing. Uh, uh, Has been very blessed this year. Uh, They applied for a food pantry assistance uh, grant and received $2,500, which 10% of it could go to uh, new equipment. That new equipment was two new refrigerators and a freezer. And then uh, also got them connected with a couple local farmers, um, to, uh, to do business with them regularly. One of the farmers uh, sold meat, which stocked the freezers with fresh beef, and the other one provided months' worth of uh, dozens of eggs, uh, which the farmers were also very, very uh, thankful for because this caught them in their slow time of the year also when we were providing them income through that. So, uh, And it's not only teach, uh, reaching the ministry itself and those who provide to it, but those who come and take part in it and receive from it. Um, God has breathed moments that are frequent in the ministry. One person uh, who received came uh, recently came through, nearly broke down as she described her husband had been laid off and she was feeling she didn't know where to turn for food until she found Grace's Grocery. She said that the quality and healthy foods available through the pantry uh, really made her physically and emotionally feel much better. Jesus will say, as you have done to the least of these, you have done unto me. These are just a few examples that we have of God moving in our church, and we would like you to share 
uh, any way he has been moving through you in your growth and through the body that you've seen. Please share those with uh, leadership team members or staff members, and we'll get those out on the website or share them on Sunday morning. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. What an awesome morning of praise this has been already, isn't it? Yes. Ah, really, really powerful, wonderful. Um, I just hope we can keep, keep that up and keep it going right now. Uh, I can ask you to pray with me as we begin. Heavenly Father, you've called us to this place, to this ministry. And we want to be faithful and loyal to you. And we thank you for the opportunities and the privileges that you give us to serve you. Lord, I pray for this message today, that as hard as it may be, it needs to be spoken. And I have just sensed in my heart that Satan is wanting to stand against this word today. That he has come to meddle in our lives and meddle in our ministries. And we stand against him this morning, Father. He has no authority in this place. He has no right to be here in our lives or in our ministry. And we cast him out in the name of Jesus. And we stand firm and strong against him and his wiles and his ways. Thank you, Jesus, for the strength you give us. We, we stand against him. I would pray even now that if there's anyone here who will stand with me, that they would rise to their feet to stand against him, to demonstrate that we are united against him. He has no reason or right to be here, no authority. All authority and glory and grace and praise belong to Jesus, and we honor him, only him. So Satan, you have no place and no right to be here today. So we cast you out in the name of Jesus, and we accept the coming of the Holy Spirit to fill our hearts, to guard our hearts, to open our eyes and our ears that we may hear from you this day. We give you praise, Jesus. We thank you for this, for the deliverance you bring in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Thank you. Thank you. <sighs> Last week, Brother Nathan, Nathan talked about the narrow gate Wow, what a great message. What a great message. When he was done, you know what my sermon was going to be today? What Nathan said. See you next week. <laughs> if you didn't hear it, go online. Powerful word. Powerful word about the wide path and the narrow gate. So I wrote down a question while he was speaking last week. I asked, why is the gate narrow when there is such a wide path? The gate is narrow not for the purpose of crowd control. It is narrow because all who enter it must do so one at a time. But it is the representation of the gate that means more to us which explains why it is narrow. It is because of the gate is one man wide. Jesus. In the Gospel of John, chapter 10, verses 7 and 9, it says, Therefore Jesus said again, Very truly, I tell you, I am the gate for the sheep. He is the shepherd, we are the sheep. And he says, I am the gate. Whoever enters through me will be saved and kept safe. So this morning I just ask you to keep this in mind. While we look at these verses in Matthew seven fifteen to 23, difficult passages, and I had to wonder why they're here. They're difficult, but later on I'm going to read the same passages, but from Eugene Peterson's The Message translation. It'll wow you. So let's take a look here at Matthew seven fifteen to 23. It really should have been uh, preached in two different parts. I apologize for that, but we're going to put them together today. And the first part starts out like this in verse 15. Watch out. I love it when a scripture starts that way. I really, really love that. It, it, watch out. Keep your eyes open. Beware. It's like you're, you're at a baseball game and this foul ball is coming screaming right at your section. Watch out. Heads up. Pay attention. Watch out for false prophets. They come to you in sheep's clothing, 
but inwardly they are ferocious wolves. By their fruit you will recognize them. Do people pick grapes from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? Likewise, every good tree bears good fruit, but a bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot bear bad fruit, and a bad tree cannot bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Thus, by their fruit, you will recognize them. And then he goes on to this, in verse 21. Not everyone says, who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. But only the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, didn't we, didn't we not prophesy in your name and in your name drive out demons and in your name perform many miracles? Then I will tell them plainly, I never knew you. Away from me, you evildoers. Yeah. In regard to the first half, false prophets, is this really something we need to still be aware of today? Yes, exactly. There is a reason why Jesus has warned us to watch out. The closer we are to the time of his return, for him to call his church, his bride, the more false prophets we're going to be seeing rising up. We must realize that we are vulnerable to this. Now you've heard people say, oh, don't take advantage of me. I'm, I'm really vulnerable right now. You know what? Satan does not care. Our pastoral search committee is beginning that process of looking at candidates, needing to discern who among all those applicants is God's choice for Grace Church. Satan is going to try to take advantage of every bit of our vulnerability. We need to beware of false prophets, of those who would lead us astray. So Jesus is speaking from the mount, already knowing that there will be those who will come and prey on Christian believers, taking advantage of us, pretending to be what they are not, convincing many that to follow them is equal to follow Jesus we are warned, watch out. And there are more scriptures that deal with, with Satan's employees here. And Paul writes to, to Timothy in 2 Timothy 2.26, they will come to their senses and escape from the trap of the devil who has taken them captive to do his will. It's the devil's purpose to wreck lives and churches, but we are not unaware 2 Corinthians, Paul writes in chapter 2, 11, in order that Satan might not outwit us, for we are not unaware of his schemes. Be on guard. And Peter writes in his first letter, chapter 5, verses 8 and 9, be alert and sober mind. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to, de to devour. Resist him, standing firm in the faith. We are vulnerable, which is why we must remain vigilant in order to be victorious. Beware of false prophets. Now, a prophet does two things, foretells and forthtells predicts and proclaims. And there are only two kinds of prophets, the ones who represent God and the ones who are in total opposition to God. How can we know the difference? We learn to be vigilant by recognizing their fruits. The work that they do is known by their results, by their fruit. They come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly, they are ferocious wolves. They may appear to be true and sincere and honest, even innocent, but inside they just want to rip you apart and devour you. 
The Apostle Paul was all too aware of this reality as he writes, Acts 20, 29, I know that after I leave, savage wolves will come in among you and will not spare the flock. Stuart Briscoe wrote of this, After Paul had gone, the magnificent church at Ephesus was torn apart and scattered because of false prophets. And John writes us again of this in his first letter, chapter 4, verses 1 and 2. Dear friends, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God. Because many false prophets have gone out into the world. This is how you can recognize the Spirit of God. Every spirit that acknowledges that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God. God. The test is found in who Jesus is. Do they confess his deity, his incarnation, his resurrection, and do they confess him as Lord and Savior? You know, even if these false prophets do make such confessions of faith, there's a better test for knowing their true identity. They will be known by their fruit. You know, it talks about... uh, uh, thorn bushes and, and thistles. There was a, a thing called a buckthorn that has grape-like uh, fruit. And from a distance, you might think, oh, those are grapes. But they're not. There's a thistle out there that's flower, as it starts to flower, looks exactly like a fig flower. They have the appearance of being good fruit, but they are not. And I've known a few of these wolves in sheep's clothing. I've even been deceived by them for a while. The Lord's judgment is upon them. But we must watch out. Be vigilant. Because we are so oftentimes vulnerable to deception. So I said I wanted to read from the message. Let's look at that first half of the verse here. Matthew 7, 15 through 20. From from that translation. Be wary of false preachers who smile a lot. (laughs) Dripping with practiced sincerity. Chances are they are out to rip you off some way or other. Don't be impressed with charisma. Look for character. Who preachers are is the main thing, not what they say. A genuine leader will never exploit your emotions or your pocketbook. These diseased trees with their bad apples are going to be chopped down and burned. Wow. So the first half of this section talked about false prophets. The second half speaks of false disciples, or better yet, pretenders. Not everyone, verse 21, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. I call them false professors. They profess Jesus as Lord, but they don't live as if it were so. Is it really possible for someone to speak prophetically in the name of Jesus, who may even cast out demons in Jesus' name and do amazing miracles in the name of Jesus and not Be a true disciple? According to Jesus, it is not only possible, but it will happen. Someone can do good works in the name of Jesus and not have a vital living relationship with him. It's not the great works we might do or how persuasive we are in preaching his word that makes any difference. It's our personal relationship with Jesus that determines everything. It is indeed very possible for someone to claim to be a Christian and talk the talk and even walk the walk. Now my favorite saying that's come in the company of yours is your talk talks and your walk talks, but your walk talks louder than your talk talks. I'm going to leave that up for a little bit so you can get that. And it's true. Your talk talks and your walk talks But your walk talks louder than your talk talks. (laughs) 
people, these false pretenders, these false professors do this not because they have a relationship with Jesus, but because they are recognized for what they do. Seen as being a Christian, but lacking that essential element of what it takes to be a believer. A living relationship with Jesus. The thing that is so shocking about what Jesus says here is not everyone who calls me Lord will enter the kingdom of heaven. Is he talking about any of us? Are any of you thinking, are you talking about me? Are you talking about me? Well, not likely. But it is wise for us to take inventory of ourselves. Why do I call him Lord? What does it mean to me to call Jesus Lord? I used to be a false professor of faith. I was talking with Joseph this week, and as we're talking, I said, I got to share this. I'd forgotten all about it. I got to tell this story. So I was, I was serving a little church. I was already preaching. I was in seminary, three years of, of the, at the school of theology I went to. There's a course that every student has to take, a preaching course. I didn't want to be a preacher. I didn't want to be a pastor. I wanted to be a counselor and do things like that. But every student was required, and most students, because it's one of those blow-off classes, they say, they, they all took it the first semester of the first year. I took it the last semester of my last year. <laughs> I put it off as long as I could. And the first sermon that's assigned to me, uh, you know, he gave me the text. Well, I didn't even have to preach. I just had to write it out and present it. And so I did. It was on, on uh, Peter's confession. They were at Caesarea Philippi. And uh, if any of you were with, with us when we went to uh, Israel, it was so cool. I, I said to our guy, I got to go to Caesarea Philippi. I got to go, we got to go there. And I told, shared my testimony there. But, but it was about Peter's confession. Jesus says, who do you say that I am? You are the Christ, the son of the living God. So that was my sermon. And I, I wrote my sermon. I turn it in. And then, you know, the next class or whenever I get that sermon back, I got an A on it. I never get A's. I got an A on my written sermon. Oh, man, I was so proud. I was so happy. It was so cool. And I'm reading through his underlines and his notes and everything else. And I get to the very bottom of the last page. And he writes this, this statement. He says, but Tom, what does it mean for you to say this? What do you mean? What does it mean for me to say this? What are you talking about? That question haunted me all day long at school. What are you talking about? What does it mean for me to say this? Why are you asking me? What? I got an A on this sermon. Why, why are you asking me that? It just stayed with me. And it was a warm spring day. I was driving home finally at the end of the day. Car windows rolled down. And I'm just, I'm, I'm just thinking about that. What does it mean for me to say that? I kept saying over again, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. All of a sudden, I screamed it. I yelled it. I shouted as loud as I could. You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And the first time, it was me saying it, not just telling others what someone else said. God is so good. He has a great sense of humor. Uh, he gave me a witness. At the same time, there was another car driving by me with his windows down, and I shouted. He gave me such a look. <laughs> I went home, and I told Vicki what, what had happened. And immediately, immediately, I knew I was a new creation. Wow. I started having this insatiable thirst for God's Word. I couldn't put the Bible down. I think people got sick of me because I... Oh, cool. Did you know this? You know, have you ever read this? This is so neat. How oh, it turned my life around. But I just want to say, I used to be a false professor. What do you think? Jesus asked in Matthew 21, 28 to 32. What do you think? 
There was a man who had two sons. He went to the first and said, Son, go and work today in the vineyard. I will not, he answered. But later he changed his mind and went. Then the father went to the other son and said the same thing. He answered, I will, sir. But he did not go. Which of the two did, the fa- did what the father wanted? The first, they answered. It is not the one necessarily who calls him Lord, but the one who does his will, who is the real believer, the true disciple, the one who will enter the kingdom of heaven. Now quite often I have seen good people do good works because of the accolades and praise and personal rewards that they receive from their hard work, not because they follow Jesus and obey his words. They live like being a Christian is belonging to some kind of a social uh, club or a certain association. They imitate good, but not because Jesus says so, because they think of themselves as good deed doers. You've heard faith without works is dead, belief without obedience, but works without faith is empty and lifeless. How do I know if my faith is real? Because Jesus knows me. Charles Spurgeon, a very powerful theologian and author, noted on this, this verse, he said that Jesus did not say, I once knew you, but cannot own you now. But here he says, I never knew you. Never. Our relationship with Jesus does not flow out of our obedience to his word. Our obedience to his word flows out of our relationship with Jesus. Just because one does good works does not mean that Jesus knows them. We can know about Jesus and never really be known by him personally, intimately, completely. The narrow gate is narrow because it's personal. We enter one at a time. Jesus is the gate. And only through him will we enter the kingdom of heaven. And Spurgeon adds, Those who accept his invitation, come unto me, will never hear him say, Depart from me. We are to be aware And beware of these, not just false prophets, but also false professors. That is, people who profess Jesus as Lord, but do not know him, and more significantly, are not known by him. False professors mistake works for relationship. Their inward nature has never changed. They may call Jesus Lord and even do marvelous works, but they are not saved. Now, for example, and I I don't like pointing fingers here, but the uh, the Jehovah Witnesses Church, they they believe they are those chosen few out of the book of Revelation, the 144,000 who will be spared and saved. But when their organization grew larger than 144K, they had to stop. They had to regroup and change their theology. How would you like to have been number 144,001? Missed it by that much. And then there are the super Calvinists who believe that the saved are, are predestined and only God knows who will be saved and there's only room for so many. Fosdick wrote this little saying. He says, we are God's chosen few All others be damned. There is no room in heaven for you. We can't have heaven crammed. (laughs) Some of them think that the only only those who are predestined, and they interpret that to mean predetermined, will be saved. That has nothing to do with faith. That regardless of whether or not you make a decision to accept Jesus, you're only saved if you're pre-selected in advance. 
I can't imagine living for Jesus and wondering if I am really one of the predetermined few. What's the point of believing in Jesus and waiting to see if your lottery number is going to be drawn once, you, once life is over? Now, that's a bit of an exaggeration, <laughs> but it makes the point. But I want to tell you the way it is. All who come to Jesus will be saved. All who walk with Jesus will be saved. All who come and enter through that narrow gate through Jesus will be saved and kept safe. Yeah. It is possible to confess Jesus with our lips and deny him with our lives. Obedience to the Lord demonstrates our love for him. First through obedience to his word then through obedience to His Holy Spirit. At the end of it all, there is judgment. Everyone, everything will be laid bare, including our own motives. There will come a day when our pretenses are revealed for what they are. All falsehood will be stripped away. We may deceive others, but we cannot deceive God. We may even deceive ourselves, but we're not able to fool God. Jesus tells us this story so that we can enter by the narrow gate. And there will be many who will be truly shocked when he says to them, I never knew you. Go away. I read again from the message translation, verses 21 to 23. Knowing the correct password Saying, Master, Master, for instance, is going to get you anywhere with me. What is required is serious obedience. Doing what my Father wills. I can see it now at the final judgment. Thousands strutting up to me and saying, Master, we preached the message. We bashed the demons. Our God-sponsored projects had everyone talking. And do you know what I'm going to say? You missed the boat. All you did was use me to make yourselves important. You don't impress me one bit. You're out of here. Wow. Isn't that an awesome portrayal of that, of that verse? So the question of the day is not, do I know Jesus, but does Jesus know me? Yeah. Again, I turn to Charles Spurgeon. Brethren, the Lord cannot say to some of us that he does not know us. For he has often heard our voices and answered our requests. He has known us in repentance, seeking mercy and receiving it. In gratitude, blessing his gracious name. In adversity, looking for his aid and enjoying it. In reproach, owning his cause under ridicule. In difficulty, seeking help and safety under his wing. In love, enjoying happy fellowship with him. In these and many other ways, he knows us. Now, I just really need to pause right here for a moment. Because yesterday and this morning has been a real struggle for me over this. Um, and, and, and that's why I felt that, that the devil was just really trying to confuse me and, and, and get me off-centered. There's something, there was something really troubling me about these verses, and I, I couldn't quite put my finger on it. I kept thinking... Why are these verses placed here? They're not like all the others. In fact, they seem to be quite contrary to the rest of the Sermon on the Mount. Why are these nine verses placed right here in the Sermon on the Mount? Did Matthew just close his eyes and throw a dart to see where he should put him? There has to be a reason for those words to be placed right here toward the end of the Sermon on the Mount. And, 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 and what troubles me more is I couldn't find any commentator, any study that talked about that, that addressed that issue. 
Even one of the books that I own that I was looking through this, it's called Sermon on the Mount, doesn't even include these verses in his chapters. The only thing I can make of it being here is that it's a checkpoint for all who want to go to heaven. In Germany, my wife and I have been to Germany a couple of times, we got to see Checkpoint Charlie. Intense place. Tight security at the time. If you did not have proper identification, you could wind up in prison or dead. It seems that Jesus is asking in this one question, checking our identity. Before you go any further, why are you here? How did you get to this checkpoint? Did the false prophets get here because they entered through the narrow gate? Hardly. And they want to sell us what what they would call insider information. Having us believe that there's a shortcut to the kingdom of heaven. Follow them. Do as they say and do. and, And they'll show you their special route. There's an easier road to heaven. I went with a friend to his mother's funeral, and it, there was the preacher was a universalist kind of a, a, a woman, and, and she's she's there and she makes a comment, "We believe everyone goes to heaven." And out of respect to my friend and the service, I didn't do this, but I wanted to jump up and say, "How? How does everyone get to heaven?" There are no shortcuts to eternal life. No quick routes to heaven. There's only one gate through Jesus himself. And do false professors enter by the narrow gate? Well, they don't think they have to. They deceive themselves into thinking that by their goodness, they'll be let in. You know, if it looks like a chicken, if it clucks like a chicken, if it lays eggs like a chicken, it must be a chicken, right? Reminds me of the story of the psychiatrist talking to one of his patients. The patient says, boy, doc, you think I'm a mess. You should see my brother. He thinks he's a chicken. And the psychiatrist says, well, you know, have him come see me. I can help. He says, I would, but we need the eggs. (laughs) That kind of reasoning, only a counselor. (laughs) <laughs> that reasoning does not work for Christians. They, they may look like a Christian, talk like a Christian, do good works like a Christian, but they are not Christian. Why? Because they have not entered by the narrow gate. Now, am I, am I being narrow-minded? These are not my words. Jesus told us how to enter through him, through that narrow gate. See, I think Jesus is saying here, before we go on, let's check your identity. Let's see if you really belong here. Because there's only one gate, one man through whom we must come in order to enter the kingdom of heaven. And I can only assume that these verses are here as a warning for us to check ourselves to check our credentials. You know, if our heart has the stamp Jesus on it, and if our souls are sealed with the Holy Spirit, then uh, then if they're not, then we're either being deceived or we're deceiving ourselves. Only by the narrow gate can we enter. If the church is to be the church, then we must reflect Jesus and point people on the wide path who are perishing to that narrow gate. It seems to me that we can go on to the that, that we, before we can go on to the conclusion on the Sermon on the Mount, we need to make sure how we got where we are. We know false prophets by their fruit or lack thereof. We know false professors by their obedience, why they obey if they obey. So yes, I will ask that question today. Why are you here? And how did you get here? And I struggled with that. 
this is not a comfortable thing to preach. But if today you have even a twinge of doubt, a minuscule amount of uncertainty, if you are 99.9% sure that you are a believer, then let's settle it today once and for all. All who come to Jesus in faith will be saved. You, know, you will know it because obedience to him will not be a chore or a challenge or even a feeling of expectation, but of joy and peace and excitement. Yes. We are obedient in response to his love for us. So let's settle it today. There should be no doubt about it. Come to Jesus now. Don't hold back. Come to him completely and he will welcome you in. At the end of this service, we'll have prayer partners here that you come and pray to if you want to. If you just have that inch of doubt, if you just want to pray about you know, anything at all, but want to come and, and just confirm that you have come through that narrow gate, they can help you. We can help you. Come see me. Come see one of us and we'll pray with you about this. I think that's why this verse is here. It's a checkpoint. Before we can go on to determine how to build on our faith, we need to make sure of how we got there. Max Lucado once wrote in the side margin of his Bible, you'll never know that Jesus is all you need until Jesus is all you have. So let's come to him. Heavenly Father, let's pray. Father, we thank you that you are the narrow gate, but that gate swings freely open to anyone who would come through it. And you have opened up yourselves to us completely by dying on the cross, sacrificing yourself. You made yourself the gate. We are your sheep. You are our shepherd. We can only enter by you. Help us, Lord, to realize that the devil would not want us to hear this. He would not want us to know this. He would want us to be deceived. He would want us to be like many other churches out there that think, oh, the whole world is open. You can, anybody can, can get to heaven. Your word, Lord, is narrow. It is Christ-sized. And only through you are we able to enter. So, Father, for any who are, are contemplating this, any who are doubting, any who will just have a, a fraction of, of question, we ask, Lord, that they will come to you, come to that gate, and receive you, and the joy and the peace that you bring. We thank you, Heavenly Father, that you provide the way. And I pray in your name, Jesus. Amen. Amen. I'd ask our, our ushers to come forward to receive. There. <laughs> this was hard for me today. I'd rather preach on those really nice topics about love and you know affection and joy. But it was last night that I really, it was actually this morning I recognized the devil didn't want me to preach this today. He didn't want me to, to talk that narrow gate like Nathan so eloquently put last week. He didn't want me to reflect on that. But, but it just flowed to that as it's going to flow to next week as we talk about building our faith now. And it just needed to be said. And I thank you, and I bless you. And as I said, if, if there's anyone that wants to pray, uh, maybe even in the back room, in the back, there'll be folks up here who are willing to, to pray for you for any reason. We invite you up. But above all, we invite you to that narrow gate to come through Jesus and stand with us. May the Lord bless you. We will be here next Sunday at the same time. Sunday after early service with cinnamon rolls at 9.
but we, or is it two weeks after yes. that? Two weeks, sorry about that. Um, but we just want you to be a part of this as we grow and ex get excited of what Jesus is doing at Grace Church. Blessings to all. Thank you for coming. Have a wonderful, beautiful day. God be with you. <laughs>